Good morning, Jumpstart Nation. Praise God, this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice, right, and be glad in it. Good morning, good morning. Yes, this is pre-recorded. I had to be out of town. We are preparing for the Friendship Conference, and there are some things I needed to take care of uh, to this morning, Friday morning. So we, uh, I am, this is Thursday night, and uh, we're recording this just for you. Praise God. I'm, so we're going to be jump-starting the Word. Want to go back and deal with the subject of hope, so hello, hello, hello. Make sure you say a howdy. Make sure you put a hello. Some of you have gotten a little bit lazy, and you're not putting any hellos or emojis. You're just kind of sort of hiding back in the wings and not reaching out, not greeting anyone. I would encourage you just to reach out and say hello to everybody this morning. We're going to take some time this morning, uh, so I greet all of you. We're going to take some time this morning and look again at the subject of hope, that inner picture, those inner pictures, that imagination. There are just some other things that are stirring around in my heart, and we're going to finish the week up with uh, talking about developing that inner those inner that inner vision, the inner visualization, the inner imagination. Praise God. First Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, I, I love this, how it starts out, and we're going to just begin to speak the word um, around this particular subject, okay? First Corinthians chapter 13 says, 13, 13, and now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now abideth. Now exists three things, faith, hope, and love. Those are the three things that God says make up life. So whatever issues you have in life, it's either a faith issue, a hope issue, or a love issue. And whatever, wherever you're making progress and succeeding, it's because you're succeeding, you're succeeding in the area of love, in the area of faith, and in the area of hope, all right? Now, I love um, what Good Speech Translation says. Instead of saying, now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, Good Speech says, these are the great three. Wow. That's what Mr. Good Speech said in his translation these are the great three. I'm telling you what, man, when you learn to operate in these three, the great three, you are going to walk in the fullness more and more of what God has for you. And uh, we want to make sure we're doing that. Um, the Taylor Translation Living Bible, These are th there are three things, faith, hope, and love that keep on forever. The New English Bible says, in a word, there are three things that last forever. There are three things that last forever, faith, hope, and love, but the most important of these in love. Love is the motive, is the why behind it all. Why do I have hope? Because of love. Why do I have faith? Why do I believe? Why do I trust God? Because of his love. Why do I have any hope? Why am I developing these inner imaginations with the Word and developing these inner pictures and these inner, inner videos, so to speak? Hope. Why? Because I know how much God loves me, and also the love of God that's in me moves me, inspires me, compels me and you to begin to hope in the Word. Praise God. Man, that's awesome. Faith, hope, say it out loud. Now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Say this out loud. These are the three great things. These are the great three. Faith, hope, and love. You know, it's, that simplifies a lot of things. When raising your children, develop their faith, faith in God, 
faith in the Word of God. They can trust the Word. If God says they can do it, they can. Faith in themselves, believing in themselves because of Christ in them and because of them in Christ. Faith, faith in you as a mother, faith in, in you as a father. Praise God. All right? Faith in God, faith in themselves, to believe in themselves, to believe in the Christ that's in them. Uh, hope. Teach kids to dream. Teach them to imagine. Teach them to think big. Develop their hope. Don't let them become hopeless. All right? Develop their hope and then love. One of the things we need to really make sure our children understand is God loves them even though others may put them down and make fun of them and and they may feel like they're weird or different or they got a zit on their face and so it's just a big crisis. Uh, teach children, God loves you. God made you on purpose. God designed you and loves you. And then teach them that if God loves them, they should love themselves. And out of love for themselves, you know what? They can love others. You know, if you can't, if you can't love yourself, I don't mean narcissistic love, selfish love. I mean a, a self-respect. If God loves me, I should respect myself enough uh, to love and appreciate who God has made me, to celebrate your individuality, amen, based on the word. Now, that doesn't mean he loves all our ways, but he loves us in spite of our ways. Now, here's the, here's the gospel of John, chapter 13, verse 34. Jesus said a new commandment, a new commandment. Instead of the Ten Commandments I'm going to of Moses, I'm going to give you a new commandment, one, one, a new one, that takes care of all the rest of them all 613 commandments. A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Did you hear that? He said, here's a new commandment for you that takes care of all the commandments. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, what comes first there? Here's what comes first. You have to first know how much God loves you before you have the heart ability to love others. It's out of your understanding and revelation of God's love for you, even in your failures, even in your weaknesses, even in your Flub ups and mess ups and shortcomings. God loves you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never reject you. He'll correct you because he loves you. But he does it for your good, not because he's angry at you. But you have to first know how much Jesus loves you, how much God the Father and the Holy Spirit love you. And then out of that, you love others. So, what's the new commandment? The new commandment is number one come to understand how much God loves you. And out of that, love others. Say this out loud. There's one commandment now. I love others just as Jesus has loved me. I love others because God loves me. See, our love for others is a reflection. Um, it's a response of because we know how much God loves us individually, not just us as a group, you individually. Say this out loud. God loves me. He loves me. Say this out loud. My, my picture is in God's wallet. Say this out loud. My picture is on God's refrigerator. That's awesome. He loves you, and when you begin to open your heart to that and begin to, to dare think it, you'll begin to love others. Jesus said, love others as I have loved you. When you come to understand as God has loved you, how he's loved you, out of that you love others. See, you don't love others because they love you. You love others because God loves you. 
That, in other words, you didn't earn God's love. He gave it to you freely. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. We were all sinners, right? And in the same way, because you have an undeserved love from God the Father, you can extend an undeserved love to others. That doesn't mean you trust people. Trust and love are two different things. There are people right now that I, wow, another angel, just another angel walked by, made me jump. Uh, we've, I've seen quite a few. Um, I, what was I saying? Well, I saw an angel last night in church. I, just another one just walked by. That They're just busy. There's activity going on. Listen to me, activity. Okay, all right. If you're new to Jumpstart, that may be weird, but angels are a common part of the Bible. I mean, angels are normal. Anyway, when you come to understand more and more how much God loves you, then out of that overflow, you love others. You know, one of the best ways to fix a marriage that has become broken and destroyed and damaged and strained, it's not to try to try harder to love your mate, to love your, your husband, to love your wife. That's not the key. That, that doesn't work. That's willpower, willpower, willpower. That's human power. The best way to increase the quality of your marriage is for you to pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, reveal to me how much you love me. Help me to see it. Help me to feel it. Help me to experience it. Help me to see it. And then when you begin, when he begins to answer that prayer, you will begin loving your husband and loving your wife more by accident than you did before on purpose. Here is Ephesians chapter 5, where the apostle Paul talks about Christ in the church and he equates it to marriage. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5. So if you need to improve a relationship, Ask God to open your eyes and heart to see how much he loves you. And then out of that, out of that, you'll respond to even people that normally aggravate you and you feel cold toward them. You've lost that natural love. He can stir that back up again. And he'll begin to um, help you to see others through the same eyes that he sees himself. Now, Here's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. <coughs> Excuse me. Husbands, love your wives, even as. Just as. Even as Christ also loved the church. Me and you, we're part of the church. So how, how does a husband love a wife? As Christ loved the church. So if the husband doesn't have any revelation of how much Christ loved and loves the church, you and me, then he'll never really truly know how to love his wife because the church is the bride of Christ. And so when you get, okay, wives, for example, you know one way to pray for your husband is God grant to them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Flood the eyes of their heart with light. When you pray that for them to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the eyes flooded, one of the things they'll see is how much Christ loves the church and how much Christ loves them and how much God the Father loves them. They'll begin, a, they'll begin to get a revelation. The Holy Spirit's going to, he's going to make sure they get it. Based on your prayer, he's going to begin to reveal his love. And when he does, that husband will begin to love you because he understands how much Christ, how much God loves them. It works. It works, praise God. Now, I want you to see something here before we go on. So say this out loud, in the name of Jesus. Now, wives, I want you to pray this. In the, say, pray this, Father, in Jesus' name, open the eyes of my husband Grant to him the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him by flooding the eyes of his heart with light so that he begins to see with the eyes of his heart 
how much you love him. Amen. That's right. Otherwise, you're doing a willpower love, and it'll, it, that kind of love only lasts as long as your willpower lasts. And when, when your willpower burns out, you'll go back to the way you were. All right? But when you receive the revelation, so what about wives? Well, wives, too, you need to pray for God to open the eyes of your heart so you can see how much God loves you. But I want you to see a little nugget in here. I'm not, I'm not going to do a lot on marriage. Ephesians 5.33, the end of that chapter, listen to what it says. Nevertheless, this is God talking. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. You know, if a husband doesn't have self-love, self-respect, he, he can't, he, he'll have a hard time loving anybody else. A lot of times, wives, the reason your husband, you don't feel like he loves you like he used to is because he's lost some respect for himself. Maybe he's involved in a sin. Maybe his career didn't turn out good. Maybe he's not bringing the money home he wants to bring home. Maybe he's let himself down. Maybe he's failed himself and needs to be encouraged. But it's impossible for a man to love his wife if he doesn't love himself, not narcissistic, selfish love, but a healthy self-respect. Okay? And so he says, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself. And watch what he says to the wife. And the wife, see that she reverence her husband. Yeah, you heard it. Reverence her husband. <laughs> See, the way God has made us as man and woman is men, women are designed, they, they need and want and desire to be loved by one man, by their husband. They desire that. This is what God's saying. And so, men, you need to love your wife and pursue your wife. You need to love her, and your example is how Christ loved the church, and he loves you, and that causes you to love yourself and have some self-respect. So out of, out of a self-respect, a self-love, you love your wife. But wives, men need to be reverenced, respected. Men operate on the language of honor. That's how God wired them. Men do, do not want to be embarrassed, corrected, put down, shamed, belittled, ignored, devalued. God has designed a man that his love language is honor, respect. Okay? Okay? But, but wives, God has so designed you to be loved. So if Husbands will spend their time loving, cherishing, valuing their wives. And wives, if you would ask God to show you, in particular for concerning your husband, how to communicate reverence and respect and honor, you know he'll show you how to do that. You know, as much as you want to correct some of his maybe habits, don't do it in public, don't do it in front of others. That's a good way to begin to destroy a marriage. All right, maybe do it privately and say, hey, honey, I just wanted to mention this to you. You know, I respect you. I love you. I respect you. But, you know, I just thought I would help you. I thought I want to be your help to you. And so here's a suggestion. All right. Notice uh, the um, uh, the M-O-N translation, Monfort. I think it's the uh, Monfort, I think. But as for you individually, you must each one of you love his own wife exactly as if she were yourself. All right? Uh, the Taylor, the Living Bible, so again I say a man must love his wife as a part of himself, and then and the wife must be careful. See to it. Be careful to respect your husband, and the wife must see to it. Here is the... Taylor Living Bible, and the wife must see to it that she deeply respects her husband, obeying, praising, and honoring him. It's just the way God's made them. That's not talking about lavishing flattery, flattering, and and uh, it means to sincerely value, honor, and respect him. Even if he's got a lot of shortcomings and flaws, and every man does, 
If he's born again, even if he's not, there's something good about him. Let let God show you. Let God show you. Begin to to acknowledge that. Okay, husbands, your wife wants to be pursued, and if you've not done that for years, she might uh, she might wonder what's wrong with you. But it's okay to begin to love her and pursue her and value her and cherish her. Show it to her by kissing and hugging and and touching and holding her hands and being kind and and uh, Rhea loves it when I help with things around the house, washing the dishes and doing things and acts of service to love her. All right? So say this out loud. I love others because God first loves me. I love myself. I respect myself. I value myself because God loves, respects, and values me. Now, husbands, you men that are on here, say this out loud. I love my wife because I love and respect myself. I love my wife because Christ loves me. Men, say this, I love my wife with the same love that Christ loves his bride, the church. All right, wives, you're ready? I'm going to see to it that I reverence my husband. I'm going to be careful to respect honor my husband. I will praise and honor him and protect his honor. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. This is the love of God. Amen. I, I wanted to get into hope, but we're talking about faith, hope, and love, and and we got over, we got over into this, but the motive, the driving force behind the dreams and the visions that God wants to plant in your imagination so that faith will bring it to pass. The motive is love. Love will drive you to dream. Let the love of God inspire you to dream big. God wants you to prosper and be wealthy. Not so you can have 15 flat screen TVs, two motorboats, two lawnmowers, 10 motorcycles. Nothing wrong with having all that, but the motive is not that. The motive is to, to fund the gospel. Do you know God needs money? He needs money. You know why? God doesn't have any money. Money is down here in this realm. God doesn't have, he can't counterfeit it. He's not going to counterfeit it. But God needs you to cooperate with him so that money will come your way so you can help finance the saving of lives. And there are billions of lives right now that are that are uh, that are in the balance. God wants you to prosper. It's the love for people. God's in the people saving business and he needs you to prosper. God needs the money. He needs you to have it so he can inspire you to give it where it needs to be given. Man, love will cause you to dream of starting a business. Love will cause you to dream of uh, of bringing in millions of dollars. Love love for people will cause you to begin to hope big and dream big. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Say this out loud. The love of God in me is compelling me to dream big. The love of God for people is inspiring me to develop big hopes, big visions, and big dreams. Glory to God. Now, here's what God said in Psalm 78, 41, and we're going to end up the week here, and we're going to pick up some more next week. Say this out loud. I am a person of vision. I am an imaginer. I'm a dreamer. I'm a visionary. Because the Holy Spirit that filled me is causing me to see visions and dream dreams and prophesy. 
Say this out loud. I am supernaturally anointed to hope big, to dream big, to imagine big things because of the mega love that's in me. Psalm 78, 41, God talking about the nation of Israel and the Jews back in the day. He said, yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited, they limited the Holy One of Israel. We could say they limited God when it came to them. Now, God is unlimited. But concerning you individually, he'll not override your will. He won't. He gave you a free will so that you could choose life or death. He won't won't violate that. But you can limit God and his will and his plan and his purpose and his dream for you. Many of you have settled for less. And as you get older, it's easier to do. But I'm telling you that are older, some of you older, more mature ones, time to, time to pull the dreams off the shelf and dream big. Don't prepare to die. Prepare to live. Assume that you're going to live forever. Okay? Don't, don't be preparing for your final day. you got too much to do. Now, they limited the Holy One of Israel. Now, they limited him by their unbelief, by their lack of imagination, by their lack of hoping, by their lack of dreaming. Say this out loud. I refuse to limit the love of God that's in me. I refuse to think small thoughts and to dream puny visions. I refuse to have small hopes. I heard the Spirit of God say just now, when your hopes are big, they can become so big that the little things don't matter anymore. The little annoyances don't matter. You can hope so big that minor setbacks and any kind of set, it just doesn't matter. Praise God. Say it out loud. I refuse to limit the Holy One of Israel. Praise God forever. Now, we're going to wrap up right here. Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the person, the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his or her delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he or she does shall prosper. Amen. And he says, The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. What's the difference between an ungodly man and a godly man? The godly man is developing a root system through meditation. He's developing roots in his heart. The word is getting rooted. He's a root man. The ungodly is like chaff. It's just no root. It's just all surface. And the winds of of adversity come and blow it away. But here's what I want you to see. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he or she meditate Day and night. Now, this word meditate is the Hebrew word hagal. It's the Hebrew word hagal. Okay? Um, And it is used again in Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The same word translated meditate in Psalm 1, 3 is translated imagine, yep, in Psalm 2, 1. So in God's mind, to meditate is to imagine while you mutter the word. It's it's not just muttering word. 
It's muttering it until you see it. It's imagining it with your mouth. Glory be to God. Say this out loud. My delight is in the law of the the Lord. My delight is in the word of God. And in God's word do I imagine in it day and night. Meditation is sanctified imagining. Meditation is sanctified visualization guided by the Word and the Holy Spirit. God wants you to imagine. Don't imagine vain things like the world is. Imagine things that are productive. Praise God. This is good. Say it out loud. I'm going to imagine on the Word day and night, and I'm like a tree planted by the rivers of water. God bless you guys. See you next week. Have an awesome rest of the day. Day.